Nazis were socialists. Just thought I'd flop that one right on your chin off the bat to frighten off all the ideologues. The party that became the Nazis existed even before the establishment of fascism, though in a greatly altered, infinitely more communistic form as early as 1920 or so. But the authoritarian colossus we know from the 40s and 30s became what it was in direct response to the ascent of Italian fascism under prime minister and eventual dictator Benito Mussolini, from whom I will now quote... State intervention in economic production arises when private initiative is lacking or insufficient, or when the political interests of the state are involved. This intervention may take the form of control, assistance, or direct management. This is from Fascism, Doctrines and Institutions, published in 1932, pages 135 to 136, in case you were fucking curious. Outright seizing the means of production is the bedrock of socialism, Marxism even. Incidentally, the book I've just quoted, essentially the Bible of fascism, was largely ghostwritten by Giovanni Gentile, the scarcely acknowledged individual who actually conceived the concept of fascism in the first place. Gentile was a philosopher and at one point an outright Marxist. He was murdered two years before even Mussolini was by commun- <clears throat> partisans. The mistaken presumption that fascism is corporatism, so often espoused and re-espoused by so-called democratic socialists to demarcate themselves from the Nazi and fascist ideology their movement inevitably inspired, is based on a quote attributed to Mussolini in the Encyclopedia Italiana, and for the reasons I've just mentioned, has seen heavy traffic in leftist circles. It's even popped up in supposed history programs on TV and YouTube. You know who you fucking are. He abandons his anti-capitalism to instead embrace private entrepreneurship with an element of syndicalism thrown in to give workers more influence without eliminating the traditional employer-employee relationship in a corporatist structure. This is bullshit. That quote is as follows. Fascism should more properly be called corporatism because it is the merger of state and corporate power. The problem? The quote is apocryphal. Outright Fiction. It not only never appears in the Encyclopedia Italiana, but the statement is outright contradicted by several within the doctrine of fascism, like the one about seizing the means of production that I just quoted. But we're not here to talk about fascists in Italy or otherwise, or how fellow travelers have said about erasing the socialistic origins of Mussolini's rise. We have noxious gender studies mages with more hair colors than personality traits for that. So let's rap about Nazis, shall we? Literally Hitler's Germany, like Mussolini's Italy, reserved the right to seize the means of production should it become unproductive. Hence the government shall intervene when incentive is lacking quote I reference from fascism doctrines and institutions. Both Italy and Germany retained this policy, though the cooperation of private industry under threat of seizure and violence meant they were rarely forced to actually employ it. But make no mistake, the threat was real. In fact, the 25 point economic plan of the Nazi party included the following quote, the nationalization of all trusts, profit sharing in large industries, and an agrarian reform in accordance with our national requirements and the enactment of a law to expropriate owners without compensation of any land needed for the common purpose. The abolition of ground rents and the prohibition of all speculation in land. A particularly alarming one was also, quote, we demand the immediate communalization of large stores which will be rented cheaply to small tradespeople. A law that wouldn't look a bit out of place at a Seattle City Council meeting. Socialist policies all, which wasn't surprising. Gottfried Feder, who first drafted them, was an adamant anti-capitalist. He was later made the economic planner under Hitler and the Nazis, as was Ferdinand Zimmermann, aka Ferdinand Fried. Reading Fried's writings in Die Tat illuminates the socialistic underpinnings of National Socialism whole cloth. He also wrote a book entitled Das Ende des Kapitalismus, a title I'm sure I don't need to translate. In 1932, Hitler asserted his first act would be an expressively socialist job creation program. Once appointed chancellor, he admittedly shifted to rearmament, but it should be noted that he repeatedly stated this was effectively a job creation program anyway. Socialists often lapse into warmongering to fund their flagging job programs. Just ask Woodrow Wilson. We'll explain why that is in a moment. Tellingly, Maynard Keynes, father of Keynesian economics and philosophical force behind most contemporary regulated economies, praised Hitler's policies in the preface to the German edition of his book, The General Theory, which was released during Nazi rule. Quote, 
Nevertheless, the theory of output as a whole, which is what the following book purports to provide, is more easily adapted to the conditions of a totalitarian state than is the theory of the production and distribution of a given output under conditions of free competition and a large measure of laissez-faire." Unquote. Socialism is not only married to Nazism, it thrives under it. But only, of course, if you consider the father of modern socialist economics to be in any way an authority on the fucking subject. Clinging to technicalities while skirting the meat of the matter is the surest sign of a facile fucking argument, and those who purport the Third Reich's economy was capitalist go one further still, ignoring the threat of seizure by government and ignoring that even what little private ownership they had was in fact largely ceremonial. The substantive powers of ownership, as with all socialist regimes, were enjoyed not by the citizenry, but by the German government. It wasn't the business owners who decided what to produce, how to produce it, or how many to produce. The Nazi government did that. It wasn't the business owners who decided how it was disseminated the market, what to charge, or even what percentage of the profit the owners actually accrued. Here again, the air quotes, capitalist government of Germany did that. Modern Sweden, whose socialist soy pods celebrate as a one of capitalist cum kami economic integration has an all but unregulated economy by comparison, and it's worth noting, the Swedish economy had to be unregulated because shortly after the sweeping socialist welfare reforms were instituted, economic growth fucking froze until deregulation began greasing the wheels once more. All I hear is that Sweden is this socialist paradise. We do have a bigger welfare state than the U.S., higher taxes than the U.S., but in other areas, uh, when it comes to free markets, when it comes to competition, when it comes to free trade, Sweden is actually more free market. But we did have a period in the 1970s and 1980s when we had something that resembled socialism, a big government that taxed and spent heavily, and that's the period in Swedish history when our economy was going south. There were waiting lines to get health care. People couldn't get the pension that they thought that they depended on for the future. At that point, the, the Swedish population just said, enough, we, we can't do this. In many ways, Sweden's economy today is less regulated than even we are. Still stewing in socialistic New Deal dog shit as we have been since World War fucking II. Thanks, FDR! who praised fascism as a wonder of civic planning, by the by. Ownership of the economy is de facto under fucking Nazism because the watchword of the day was collectivism. Watch those rallies, folks. See a lot of fancy dans and stunning and brave individuals in that fucking crowd? And study the actual content of the speeches if you don't believe me. In his Reichstag speech on January 30th, 1941, Hitler discussed the origins of the Reich and of the National Socialist ideology in the wake of the political upheavals at the end of World War I. Quote, we chose a path between two extremes. The one of these extremes was holding our people. It was the liberal individualist extreme which made the individual not only the center of interest, but also the center of all action. On the other hand, our people were tempted by the theory of universal humanity, which alone was to guide the individual. We saw the people as a community of body and soul formed and willed by providence. We are put into this community, and within it alone can we form our existence. We have consciously subordinated all considerations to this goal, have shaped all interests according to it and all our actions. Thus, the National Socialist world of thought arose, which has overcome individualism. This common interest regulates and orders, if necessary, curtails, but also commands. Looney Uncle Adolf puts a finer point on it later in that very same speech when he says, economically, it meant building a national German economy which appreciated the importance of private initiative, but subordinated the entire economic life to the common interest. Nazi businesses were implicitly owned by the state, because Nazi citizens were implicitly owned by the state. Not only is Nazism socialist, its authoritarian nature flows from fucking socialism. Permit me to make a microcosmic example. Price and wage controls, a classic weapon of socialism that we've sadly adopted ourselves in ever-increasing abandon, were imposed on Germany in 1936. This in response to the Nazis vastly overinflating their monetary supply upon achieving power three years previous. In order to fund their exorbitant military increase, not to mention all those welfare and public works programs Bernie Bros and Espresso Socialists refused to fucking acknowledge the Nazis ever had. Anyone who knows anything about Austrian economics knows well what happened next. 
shortages. The eternal and inevitable ally of the over-engineered economy. Lower or raise prices as there's a rush on one product, another exists in abundance. It's simply an economic inevitability whether you're dealing Deutschmarks or fucking wampum. Really, there's only two ways to deal with this self-imposed economic purgatory. Either eliminate price controls, which we know isn't happening under autocratic socialist dictatorships, or assume direct oversight over what is produced, for whom, and fucking when. Both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Bolsheviks took the latter approach. No socialism here! Ludwig von Mises, famed Austrian economist and witness to World War I and II, described this as the German or Nazi model of socialism, distinct only in that it was incrementally less obvious than that of the USSR and later China. One of the foremost illusions ever fashioned by the media and intelligentsia is of the mythic existence of the socialist economic model. This, to put it bluntly, is a flagrant fucking lie. Because socialism by its very nature is not constructive, but oppositional. Marx emphasized a worker's revolt against capitalism. Engels said, quote, the theory of all communists may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. Socialism has no economic model because socialism by its very nature is nothing more than the negation of capitalism, a dark mirror image of an existing model, and therein lies its repeated fucking failure. To be defined by your opposite is to be nothing at all. Ask a Levian Satanist or for that matter, the modern Democratic Party. Worse still, the strictures required by what socialists construe as a socialist economy explicitly require a dictator's touch. It's right there in the name. Wage controls. The new wages are utterly worthless without the control to enforce them if you do not sublimate to them, particularly as it's in the self-interest of the entire merchant class to skirt price controls and charge whatever the flying fuck they want as demand for a given item rises or fucking falls. And mere fines aren't going to dissuade a damn soul from doing so, leaving one recourse. Simple, severe, often violent penalties with concrete, merciless implementation are the only option available. The black market births itself otherwise. Hell, even North Korea can't control its black market, and that's with mandatory TV propaganda playing in every home and business, the threat of imprisonment and execution, an unbending curfew, and closed borders! This means in order for price controls to persist, merchants must live in mortal terror of selling the wrong item to the wrong man, being outed as a black market seller, and sent off to Auschwitz. Why do you think all these socialist uber utopias inevitably need a secret police and the arbiter of enforcement in these instances is virtually forbidden from being a group of your goddamn peers because the courts couldn't handle that caseload if they fucking wanted enter on the spot arbitration want to give prison a pass talk to my pal hans over there holding the luger and this is all to enforce a pissant policy like price controls. Add all the other idiocy promised by the Politburo. Take allocation of labor, for example. Question. If you can only work at a particular job ordained by the socialist state according to national need, what's to stop you from working wherever the hell you actually want? Answer. Gated districts with checkpoints manned by military or sometimes secret police. Papers, please! Never mind the civic resentment this cultivates and the necessity to head off potential revolution through show of fucking force. Beginning to see why socialism always winds up in jackboots and beatings, because otherwise, without Himmler or his like, every item, no matter how municipal or innocuous, from welfare to fucking price policing, is utterly unenforceable. And the Nazis didn't even need this excuse to unleash their totalitarian wet dream, for the record, because by the time price controls were on the menu, motherfuckers were well on their way to World War II. Price controls became a happy byline to beating political enemies and rounding up undesirables. Soviet Russia took this a step further by enshrining in its political document the seizure of all property by the state, meaning a black market was literal fucking theft from Stalin or Uncle Adolf's back pocket, which is why in both Nazi Germany and the USSR, black market activity ended in execution. In both nations, economic policy was specified as more than a mere guidepost for market activity, but is the sovereign law of the land. No socialist nation naturally being able to function if it were being subverted. And as such, dealing black market goods on the sly was expounded in the law as an act of outright sabotage. Perhaps more than any other single lie in all of American academia, the myth of the unmade Marxist utopia that might exist, but is simply too impractical to implement because of the dark desires of man, is among the most pernicious, invidious fucking lies ever formulated. Because when you analyze these 
Japanese models, one fact screams into view. Stalin didn't exploit the ideology of Engels and Marx. Marxism made Joseph Stalin. It made Mussolini. And it made Hitler too. It required him. And it always fucking will. The difference in terms of practical application between the twin branches of socialism is a matter of picking your deus ex play style. Bolsheviks blow down the front fucking door, lay waste to the NSF, and seize the means of production down the barrel of a gep gun. Nazis implement socialism by stealth, depriving the public of their property slowly, by degrees, but under no less overt a threat of force and subjugate Liberty Island one hacked security terminal at a time. Bernie bros can pound on that caps lock key and shriek, Socialist Nazis are just a meme, and storm fronters can cry and call me a fence sitter all you fucking like, princess. The record is the record, the quotes are the quotes, and I don't remember any of the Bilderbergs drafting Hitler's speeches or economic policy for him. I'm Razor Fist. God fucking speed. <laughs>